Hare Krishna, Hridayan Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining once again for our discussion on uh, the uh, Taliban, Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. So in our first part, we broadly discussed the law and order dimensions where, uh, where terrorist or disruptive activities need to be corrected. And then also the administrative dimensions where you said that democracy was not, democracy or even the idea of a nation state that is not the only legitimate center unit of authority political authority so what we, what the main point which we came to at that point which we can discuss today is that you said it systems won't assure good governance it is people who run the systems that are good citizens will lead to good governance yes and, i also want to, I, i want to make clear that by saying there are other legitimate forms of government i don't mean to justify the taliban oh okay so i'm not i didn't mention that point as a way of saying that the taliban are good people and you know i i really like what they're doing that was not my point yeah <laughs> i i was just saying that you yeah it's not enough just to say it's not a democracy as if you don't need to say anything else hmm yes mara i think you give examples also of in the power of the greek uh, city states and others where there was a, there was administration which is going on quite smoothly when yudhishthir's administration we discussed so there was monarchy which is also quite virtuous so so from the perspective of creating good citizens you mentioned that we need a certain level of god consciousness or at least a certain level of sattva and even the american constitution was uh, it implied acceptance of god and virtuous citizen citizenship even if there was explicit distancing between state and religion but that was not meant to endorse or advocate atheism so the challenge that comes up is that aren't values that are to be fostered a matter of individual choice how does a state Like well, 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 yes and no. For example, if someone, if someone ha- has the value that uh, I think it's okay for me to kill other people, or I think I can rape other people, I mean, everyone is is not free just to pursue their own values. There are obviously limits. Hmm. We pursue our values. I mean, I mean, we have we we have to be a little sober here. We pursue values within systems. and there's no functional government of any kind on earth where everybody can just do whatever they want yes that is that is true maharaj and this brings us to the difference between say what is legal and what is moral and nowadays there is a lot of uh, criticism of moral policing where you know keep your uh, keep your religion or yeah, your- but the, yeah 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 but that's also another that is, that's just another kind of moral policing Oh god that's really okay yes so true yeah i mean that's just because you just have different values your values are that people should have lots of freedom that's a value and you are policing anyone that doesn't follow your values so let's not be hypocrites here the problem is that people this is not a philosophical age people yeah it's hard to have a rational discussion nowadays uh because of the age we live in So that's it. Yeah, that's just another kind of moral policing. Okay. I mean, no one more no one is as much a moral police person as the political correctness people. If you say one wrong word, you're racist, you're sexist, you're this, you're that, you have to be canceled. So I think if anyone is trying to be the moral police of society, it's the um the people who are trying to enforce political correctness. Yeah, that is true. It's sometimes something which has somebody has said way 10 years ago 15 years ago in their youth those those tweets are dug up and they are held to almost uh, cru- crucify the person now so yes that's so true so in yeah. one so in one sense uh, every state or every system of authority will involve some pol- policing and by calling something well, as yeah, policing, for example the, the 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 generally the position on the left has always been 
that you should not impose your values unless I agree with them. Just like, for example, I remember back in the late 60s, uh, young people wanted to just have free sex. They were saying the government has no right to regulate what we do with other people. And yet the same people who were saying you can't impose morality, you can't legislate morality. That was one of the slogans. You cannot legislate morality. And the very same people were saying that were demanding civil rights legislation, you know, marching to Washington. So basically the pos position on the left has always been that you should not legislate morality that I don't agree with, but you must legislate morality that I do agree with. Oh, that's striking. So, and last in the last session, you also mentioned that even the civil rights movement is based on a metaphysical claim that the equality of all living beings. That is, yes. that is not a, it's a moral claim ultimately. So, of course, it's not even ultimately, it's a moral claim from the very beginning. It's not, you don't have to go all the way to the ultimate sense of it. It's a moral claim from the, from the first moment you say it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's what it is. It's, it's an attempt, the civil rights movement, or nowadays, you know, whatever, racial equality, is absolutely a movement to impose moral values on other people. And uh, so, therefore, I mean, the very idea of society is the imposition of a moral value. Because people could say, we shouldn't have society. Everyone should just do whatever they want. People can live in houses or caves or they can do whatever they want. So as soon as you say society, you're already imposing moral values. Hmm. So then can you... Yeah, this whole thing about this, this whole thing about not imposing, you know, uh, uh, morality or moral values, it's just, it, it's one of the more mindless uh slogans of our time oh okay that's interesting when can we say that there is some kind of differentiation between say social values and personal values because i think no. in western, western well, you, well, you, yeah, well you can distinguish only if and to the extent that your individual decisions do not affect society again the slogan, the battle cry of the American Revolution was no taxation without representation. If certain kinds of behavior tax society, then society has a rational, legitimate interest in regulating behavior that taxes it. Oh, okay. So, and then obviously for the way a person conducts themselves sexually, that is going to affect society because that actually is centered around procreation. Well, for one thing, for one thing, it's a it's it's a psychological fact that the lustier someone is, the more vain they will be. You know, the more the more um, selfish, it, it, because the sex impulse is a very powerful impulse, mm -hmm. and 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 if if advertisers are constantly trying to arouse people's erotic uh, nature. That means you're going to have a society where everyone is identifying with their body and identifying with your body is the opposite of seeing everyone as equal because to see everyone as equal, you have to go beyond the body. And also if you have all this sexuality, all this eroticism, then people will tend to be proud and selfish and, uh, and proud selfish people cannot sustain a moral society. Yeah, and that's, so it's a very striking point, Maharaj. I never thought of it this way that the more we identify people with their bodies, we cannot see them equally. In fact, yeah. sexual selection is probably the greatest form of, you could say, partiality or discrimination that is widely prevalent in today's world. Even those who so champion equality, they're not just going to say, okay, there is this teeming humanity, just pick up any sexual partner. They will want to look at somebody who has certain attractive features. The more you, the more you, well, men will kind of take whatever they can get, at least for one night. It's, um, oh God, okay. if it, it, well, you know, real facts. I mean, many yeah. men, not all, men, of course, but um, if you want a moral society, if you want people to make decisions, not selfishly, but thinking of the good of others, and if you want the citizens to be honest and respectful, 
then you can't you can't promote eroticism. That's the last thing that's going to get you a society of peaceful, selfless citizens. You need to promote virtue and values. And so therefore society, you know, it, it doesn't take much study of history to see that generally moral systems tend to come from metaphysical systems because a moral system is fed metaphysical. And so if you say, uh, you know, what's the basis, what's the justification for a metaphysical system, it, it has to be rooted in some kind of metaphysical truth, like the existence of a God. And so therefore, if society is very materialistic and just, uh, there's, there's no regulation of just, you know, allows people just for profit, just for profit, just for selfish profit to try to radically eroticize and sexualize human society. You're just going to get a bunch of animals and animals cannot sustain democracy. They cannot sustain anything. They're just animals. And so and so therefore. Allowing people publicly in advertising and in Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood, they don't care who lives or dies. They just want to make money. And so, therefore, if you allow that, then you can't expect a moral society. You can't expect people to behave properly. You can't even expect to survive, really. It's actually, I, I mean, this moral, complete moral collapse is an existential threat to society, actually. Oh, okay. So Maharaj, this is this brings us to this the the danger of the other extreme. Yes, if we don't want society to get to the society to get eroticized, but if we consider the Taliban, they they say that women should completely cover themselves and. Yeah, but, that's going, but, yeah, but that but that's going too far. I mean, if you then, now like, who is well, going to decide what is too far? Again, there well, is some for, in my life. I am. In my life, I mean, I mean, I'm going to form my own judgments. I'm, I'm hopefully a reasonably intelligent human being, and therefore I'm going to study the matter and come to my own decision. After all, you know, they um, I mean, one way to, you know, you can just castrate everyone, you know, allow everyone to reproduce maybe two or three times and then castrate everyone or all the men. I mean, you know, there, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. But if you are, and, and I don't think you're really establishing morality, you don't really have a moral society unless people, to some extent, are acting voluntarily. I mean, it's very famous that all these uh, rich people in the Middle East, they all go down to Mumbai you know, to get prostitutes. There's a huge uh, prostitution industry. So you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on. So... Okay. By by repressing women and treating them like like you know it's horrible. I, I I don't know. That's just my reaction. When, when I was in France, that has a you know significant Muslim population, and I saw the women all covered like that. I, I found it offensive. I didn't find the um, the women offensive, but um, I just something about it just struck me as very unnatural, very abusive and oppressive. And just not letting half of society just have a reasonably normal life. So, mm -hmm. so therefore, uh, plus, I mean, brutalizing society, killing everyone that disagrees with you, uh, basically keeping half the society in a permanent state of imprisonment, which is kind of the situation of the women. Um, yeah, to me, that's not, that's not. A legitimate way to establish morality. This is a very important one. Well, what he said is morality has to be voluntarily chosen to a large extent. So then, at, 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 least, at, at least by you know everyone that's not you know everyone that 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 has that's not a shudra, or even shudras can choose. So, yeah. so, yeah, so I mean, I mean, uh, a society, a good society, is one in which people embrace goodness not one in which people are kept in a state of imprisonment. Yes. So from the, uh, if, we, if we look at it from a, say, broad Vedic perspective, last time you mentioned how Yudhishthir was not imposing, uh, say, Krishna Bhakti on everyone. And you translated Dharma as justice. 
So well, yeah, dharma. Yeah, dharma means duty. It means justice. It means law. Yeah, For example, the, law, the the ancient law books of India are called dharma shastra. So, you know, assuming the law is fair, then justice and law, you know, yes. are in some ways synonymous. Yes, Maharaj. Now the point I was making is that. So you see, where does the ambit of uh, ambit of uh, we could say bhakti end and the ambit of dharma begin? That means we don't impose. If I believe in God, I am not going to impose my belief in God on others. We discussed that. That's that's one aspect which the government shouldn't be doing. But the very but, existence but they, of but, God. But, they, but, but people have to behave properly. Yeah. They can't steal. They can't murder. They can't rape. I mean, they have to, you know, people have to behave honestly and honorably. Okay. So, so are there in the Dharma Shastras or anywhere guidelines of what all constitutes, uh, say, responsible social behavior as separated from the devotional behavior? Well, the, uh, the Man of Smriti is, is considered to be a very corrupted text over time because Precisely because it's a law book, everyone that wanted a law kind of had, you know, hired a pundit to write a Sanskrit verse. So, I mean, there's some pretty horrible things. I, um, there were some, uh, some people who were fighting against giving women opportunity to be gurus in this con, and they were saying something about the Manu Smriti. So I sent a long list of quotes of, of pretty horrible things, like if a woman... I don't know, maybe it's adultery or something, because then you, she should be thrown to wild dogs to be eaten alive or something. I mean, I mean, so this stuff got a little out of control. And yes. I, I think it's, um, we, uh, we have no assurance, we have no certainty that we have the original um, Manusmriti, and it tends to be a very severe document. It's not, it's not a philosophical document. It's not, it's, it's not especially philosophical. And I think the Bhagavatam gives us just more interesting information. Okay. So uh, now Prabhupada talked about the four regulative principles and he talked about them in terms of the four Values. Yeah, but, but also just to get back to one other point, if you talk about, say, the Manu Shastra, the Manu Smriti, uh, it's giving laws for a very simple society, which is good. I mean, simple is good. It's a very simple agrarian society. But nowadays, I mean, you can't look in the Manu Smriti and find, for example, laws are going to regulate insurance contracts or, or about, let's say, you know, should there be censorship of online communication? I mean, there's all kinds of modern issues that simply are not dealt with. So, because mm. society is so much more complex now. Yeah, and I, I think that is, last time you also mentioned that the extent of technology determines the level of control or uh, level of the ambit of the governance, the signature of governance that's going to be there. Well, well, life is just much, much more complicated nowadays. And, and, and I don't mean to say better. For example, let's say you're brahminically inclined, but but a person wants to have a family. So you have to main, the person has to maintain the family, wife or children. And yet, if you want to be a Brahmin, in the modern world, you have to get a job. But if you get a job, you're Sudra, but you want to teach, so you're a Brahmin. So it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. The, um, the Varna system assumes an agrarian economy and the relatively simple social structures that come with an agrarian economy. Oh, okay. So, so then if that has to be adapted in today's world, that will also require a lot of, like you said, in, individual responsible decision-making. We can't just draw from those codes uh, directly. It's, it's not... Those kinds of laws are not always absolute. For example, uh, example I've given frequently when... Krishna and um, Arjuna arrested Ashwatthama, uh, and there was debate between Bhima and Draupadi over the severity of the punishment. And you have two pure devotees who disagree, and so there there aren't absolute shastra principles for every law. Like, what should the 
speed limit be on public roads or or you know or rates of taxation mm. you know what are taxation rates if someone you know what's the cutoff like if you make over a certain amount of money per year then you have to pay so much taxes or if you make under a certain amount you're uh, given an exemption from so i mean i mean to actually govern a society there are thousands and thousands of things that are not covered in that's right. ancient so, uh, Maharaj, uh, that's, once we get into the nitty gritties of governance it's very complicated uh, what i was trying to uh, uh, ask over here is this, where do we get the guidelines uh, where uh, where do we get broad parameters or guidelines for deciding uh, when the so attempt to say legislate morality or infuse god consciousness is going towards a extremist area like say what the taliban is doing we don't want so one extreme is complete materialism another is religious fanaticism now how on what basis will we will that be determined that okay this is veering toward fanaticism yeah yeah i understand yeah you you the leader of the society would have to have very clear ideas of what they're trying to achieve and then given the nature of the society that they're trying to govern uh how can they achieve that for example in the west and this something which has been true for thousands of years people are less submissive people in asia have tended to be over time more submissive to authorities whether it's their parents or the government whereas in the west they're less submissive and so people in the east have tended to think the westerners are kind of barbarians rebellious and the western people have tended to think that the asians are uh sort of too pliant uh, obsequious. obsequious okay yeah they, they just kind of like bow down to their leaders and don't think for themselves so so there are cultural differences and you know let's say if iskon actually or say devotees somehow got the um support of a society a country and devotees were elected to office first of all you'd have to consider what the local culture is you can't mm. you can't legislate rules or systems that are simply impossible that people won't follow and so you have to take take consideration of the local culture and what's possible and what sequence what order to do things in how do you want to achieve certain goals at some um, when i was younger i thought yeah i could manage things but now i'm thinking i don't think so so it's it's very it's very complicated there have to be there probably would be a period there, there would be a period of at least decades where there was very vigorous debate and discussion both among devotees and among devotees and non-devotee experts and just trying to understand what are the goals we have what are what values should society promote and how do we get there so it's complicated oh okay so yeah in one sense we within our movement also struggle to manage our own small popula- small population so we have to manage the world's population is going to be a huge challenge so <laughs> oh my god that's a very good point that's a very good point is khan does anyway no comment Go yes maharaj so just going back to the taliban issue so so can we say that uh, that they are going towards extreme so where does that extremism in trying to impose one's religion come from is it coming from uh, it the mode of ignorance or mode of passion or where yeah, how do we understand yeah. Yeah, Rajoguna and Tamoguna. Okay, so rather than say, so in one sense, what has happened is that there have been ex- examples of religious extremism, which, as you said, even America, the the separation of state and religion was because of the violence among Protestants and Catholics that was there in Europe. So sometimes religion is equated it with its most extremist versions. and then if we start imposing religion this is what we are going to get in society so how do we differentiate between what is say an extremist version of a religion and what is a more mainstream or a version that promotes that is based in satvaguna and promotes satvaguna and god consciousness 
how how can that differentiation be achieved say for example some people consider that the taliban are uh, are muslim so some people may consider the whole of islam as uh, as an extremist religion or many times in i have seen in american media uh, hindus and muslims are largely morally equated that muslims commit violence against hindus and hindus commit violence against muslims so for example the kashmir issue came up now uh, when india removed the article 370 so uh, so basically the thing is that how do we differentiate when a particular religious group is acting extremistically is it because of the ideology of their religion or is it because of the psychology of the particular individuals uh, propagating that religion in that area oh it may be both it may be both i mean there have been many muslims who are peaceful good people many but the dominant strain the that seems to of course i mean there are also secularist movements for example in egypt when they had a uh, they elected that president morsi i think his name was yes and um, and then the military came in and they removed him because they wanted a sec- more secular government they didn't want you know islamic extremism fanaticism violence so so if if you look at the muslim world that there is of course variety indonesia is different bosnia is different where there's a lot of muslims so it's but in general in general um yeah there uh Anyway, I'll leave it at that. We just you have to just look at different places and see what's okay. going on. So so then the question is that how do we if we are going to promote religious values or we could say theistic values or god conscious consciousness then uh, how do we ensure that what is being promoted actually promotes sattva guna and is not used by raja guna or tamo guna? by people in tamaraj because that's what is uh, is we could say in people's memory even in india the historical memories of partition and religious extremism that was there and it led to severe violence so how do we promote um, sakuna without going in towards religious fanaticism realistically if krishna blesses this world with powerful krishna conscious leaders then things will go well mm. it's um for example i am a member of iskon so you know clock is ticking time is passing i will have we all will have to leave this world that's the universal human condition So even now when I'm alive or or when I'm gone I have absolutely no influence because I'm gone um you know will people in this gone will people in other religions or in other movements will they will there be good leaders god conscious leaders who do the right thing what I have no power to all, we can talk about what the world needs but then if whether or not that actually appears in this world is something far beyond our control mm. so i you since face that's true it's quite a sobering truth actually so in one sense you mentioned this point earlier about uh that there has to be cultural uh, cultural nuances and cultural adaptations so is extremism that is there say the taliban is uh, depicting that is it because of a particular uh, not just psychological orientation of its leaders but also certain ideological conceptions that because they in one sense they are trying to turn the clock back to how people lived in the 7th century when islam was founded so to what extent does uh, practicing we could say dharma involve turning the clock back or is it more like turning on an inner compass uh, um i would say economically good luck if you want to change it i mean if aristotle mentioned that um in his view 
the human society went through periodic collapses and then it, it grows again. And so um, it's um, God only knows. I think all we can do is just try our best. All we can do is try our best to spread this sublime Krishna consciousness, try to persuade people of all the many, many powerful benefits of practicing bhakti yoga under Prabhupada's guidance. Yeah. And uh, in our, which, sorry, the you world mentioned. is, there, there was a song that was popular when I was a young boy. The song goes, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And that's about it. You know, we try our best. We can try to teach. We can try to promote more effective leadership within his country. We can try to appeal to the world to support Christian consciousness. But when I was young, I, I, I had more confidence that something could be done. We can, but now I've come to a point where I, uh, I just see more than ever in my life that everything really depends on God, on Krishna. And we just try our best work hard, try our best, but Oh, okay. Like that prayer the Christians say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's all we can do is just try our best to help this poor planet. That's quite sobering. So in one sense, uh, has the power of as the world has become more complicated and more interconnected, has the power of individual human agency diminished substantially, or it is just uh, it is just the same as it has always been? I think it's going in both directions. I mean, some someone can become a YouTube star, <laughs> not okay. only as a not only as a musician, but like in the case of the uh, professor. Peterson, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can reach millions and millions of people. It used to be that um, you had to have support from some major television network or news outlet or something. But there's been a democratization of communication. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, some things are better, some things are worse. Oh, so, yes, uh, right. so then, so broadly speaking, is taking that concept of turning back the clock, is that an integral part of, say, the broad Vedic tradition or Vaishnava tradition in particular? Because in general, every uh, religious tradition does have a very reverential attitude toward the past. Not. Yeah, but not turning back the clock in the literal sense. Let's recreate the world exactly as it was 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago. That's obviously. So the question is, how do we take the essential principles, the most valuable principles, and how do we translate them in so that they are intelligible in the modern world? Oh, okay. So then, uh, but sort of turning, turning back the clock. I mean, there's no such thing as turning back the clock. I mean, obviously you can't do that. I mean, e even the phrase "turn back the clock" is already anachronistic because, in you know, five thousand years ago, I don't think they had clocks. So even to say, you know, turn back the <laughs> clock, okay. you're already being unrealistic because they didn't use clocks back then. Maybe they had hourglasses, or I don't know that. You know, they were, we know in Vedic culture, they were extremely attuned to the movements of celestial bodies, sun and moon. So they, 
Like, for example, there are statements in some of the um, supplementary Vedic literature that says that when does a Brahmin perform the Agnihotra? And then it'll say, just when the sun gets over the trees. Now, in some, obviously, parts of India, uh, they had taller trees in other parts. Or we know that in peninsular India, South India, going more toward the equator, um, you know, the, the length of the, you know, the days are, are, the closer you get to the equator, the most, the more the length of days and nights are the same all throughout the year. And, and the farther you get away from it, the more they're different. So although something weird happens when you get near the, uh, not at the North Pole, but you start to get, you know, even like in, Sweden, where in in the summer the sun just kind of it rises, but only goes just over the horizon. Then it just it goes around like that. So it's so therefore an injunction like that perform Agnihotra when the sun gets over the trees. It's going to be different. It could be even different in different villages in India, the same place. You could have neighboring villages. One has a lot of tall trees, and the other one doesn't. So so um, yeah, turning back the clock. It's, uh, hmm. how, I mean, that's absurd. Are you going to go around the world, you know, sort of like the, as the naturalizer, the terminator, you can be the naturalizer where you go and turn off everybody's computers and. Okay. It's just, um, yeah, that is true. In one sense, even though some of like I, before the, then the ISI was there, they were quite active on social media. So they were talking about turning back the clock, but they were using social media of today's world to recruit people, to make propaganda. So yes. Who was doing that? Who no, was doing that? The Islamic State. Oh. Islamic State was quite active on social media. They were recruiting people from Europe and even India and other places. So that makes sense. So Maharaj. Yeah, and also, and also they were, anyway, there were all kinds of contradictions. So go ahead. Yeah. So. If we consider right now the the say the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, so the main concerns that we say from uh, as a devotees, it's quite close to India, and India may it India may India has already bore a lot of brunt of terrorism. Mm, so the concerns we could say is one from one one perspective, the law and order, and that has to be like you discussed immediately. That has to be countered by whatever is whatever is the appropriate measure. So like what America did after nine eleven. But from the perspective of religion, there has in uh, the broad Vedic culture, even the Vaishnava culture, has bore uh, the brunt of Islamic intolerance in many ways. Many of our devotee temples, uh, our Goswami temples, and other temples were also desecrated. So, in general, well, I think by far, by far, the people who have suffered most from Muslim. The Islamic terrorism, of course, Muslims. They are by far the largest percentage of victims. That's interesting. That means one version of Islam terrorizes another version of Islam. Is that oh, absolutely? Well, they've been doing that since they started. I mean, I mean, as soon as as soon as Muhammad, the prophet, as soon as he passed on. Uh, you know, there were civil wars, there were fighting, assassinations between Shiite and Sunni. I mean, the basically as soon as Muhammad was gone, um, fighting began between Sunnis and Shiites. And they're still fighting. You know, they had they they so oh yeah, by far, by far the the the, the greatest percentage of victims. Uh, are Muslims themselves. So, now, we could say that uh, at one level, Muslims have been victimized by Islamic extremism. So then, can we just uh, put it, the source of it, only to the psychology of people, if we say it's only because of modes, and it has got nothing to do with the, with the ideology of the particular religious system, then um, well, well, well. When you have a religion 
that began in warfare, grew in warfare, uh, and of course was always kind of very enthusiastic, at least many people about jihad. We know about all the atrocities in India. Hmm. So there is something wrong there. I mean, there's something wrong with that picture. Okay. So last time you mentioned one point that the idea of a holy war, because jihad is also, I suppose, considered to be like what holy war is talked about in Christ Catholicism or Christianity. And that is very different from Dharma Yuddha. And you, you went to the point of saying holy war is almost a demoniac. So could you differentiate yeah. further between that holy war and... Uh, um, yeah. The Dharma Yuddha just means you fight when it's unavoidable to preserve justice and the freedom of the people. Or if you're attacked, you have to defend yourself. So that's Dharma Yuddha. Holy war, the idea that you go and you slaughter people and torture people and, you know, disrupt other societies to force them to join your religion. That's, that's pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's awful. Mm. So, for example, uh, say last time you also mentioned this point that it was not that the Kurukshetra war could have been avoided just because if they say Duryodhana had suddenly become a Vaishnava. So that is more in terms of a, he, he could nominally change his religious affiliation, but he had to, when Krishna went as a peace messenger and offered him peace. So that was uh, more of uh, he correcting the injustice of having seized the kingdom. Mm. Yes, if you, if you look at, you look at Krishna's, activities as an ambassador going to Hastinapur and uh, arguing with the gurus that they should do the right thing, avoid the war. Krishna never argued that unless you all surrender to me, we will attack you. Okay, that's if you, very true. If you, look at the, if you look at the arguments that Krishna gave, to the gurus, it had nothing to do with everyone in their country converting to Vaishnavism. It had nothing to do with it. In fact, we know that when Krishna was traveling through mostly what is now India, especially going from Hastinapura or Indraprastha back to Dwarka and so on, that there were very large numbers of people who, who loved Krishna, who, who saw Krishna as this extraordinary divine figure. And so, and some of those people, like Bhishma, we have the case of Bhishma, who fought for the wrong side, and, um, but he's considered a Mahabhagavat devotee of Krishna. So, so yes, the war was not, I mean, the very fact that you had Vaishnavas on both sides shows that it was not a religious war. That's true. So now, if uh, so, so, so the Dharma Yuddha is more for justice than, as you said, justice, freedom, basic, basic human survival and uh, basic human rights. You could say yes, because because Vedic culture respects the right of people to choose their own religious path, it does not respect their right to abuse their neighbors. Oh. And so therefore, therefore, when people, Dharma Yudha is necessary when people, cert certain rulers are denying justice to the people or just doing really crazy things. Like Jara Sunda, who wanted to make a living sacrifice by to mm. Kali butchering all these Yadu princes. So that's not about religion. It's about not being a demonic barbarian. Mm. It's not about so yeah. I, I don't I I don't know. I can't remember a single case in our literature where someone goes to war to change the religious orientation 
of another country. That's fascinating. Yeah. Actually, yeah, if we, even in Lord Chaitanya's times, we have Prataprudra was fighting with Prataprudra was attacked by Krishna Dev Rai, and both of them were Vaishnavas. So, in one sense, it was not so much. So, even if, the, and that is, of course, much more recent times. So, Maharaj, before this, you made the statement that the right to choose one's own faith, but not the right to disrespect religion, the, your neighbors. So, in one sense, these are the two commandments of, uh, uh, of Christianity love God and love thy neighbor. So, in one sense, love God. Well, actually, more... actually, actually, those two injunctions came from the Old Testament. Yeah. They were originally course, yeah. Jewish commandments, and, and Jesus quoted them. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes, Maharaj. So, Jesus, so, but then in one sense, you could say, so you, what we are saying is, love God is more of a, uh, love your neighbor is something which is required to be legislated by society, but loving God is something which is more of a matter of individual choice. Well, no, 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 society can't order you to love your neighbor because your neighbor may be really obnoxious and unlovable. I mean, you can always love your neighbor as a spirit soul, but as a human being, as a human being, your neighbor may be just really unlovable. What Vedic society does command you to do is that you cannot uh, commit violence against your neighbor. You cannot steal your neighbor's property. You cannot abuse the members of the neighbor's family. So those are all moral principles those are all moral principles so it's it's interesting that, i mean amazingly there kind of was you know we don't think of it that way a type of even you could say modern separation of church and state in in ancient india so that when the king, let's say a Vaishnav king, performed great sacrifices, but those sacrifices, of course, you mentioned Vishnu, Yagyo, Vai, Vishnu, and so on. But they're not, the sacrifices are not explicitly to convert everyone to Vaishnavism. And so, hmm. and so there was a, there was freedom of speech, for example, when everyone believed that the Pandavas had died in the house of Lack, and that it was a, and that the the Kurus had murdered them. Duryodhana had arranged it with the permission of his father, so everyone kind of knew that, and so people were very upset. They went right into the center of the city and began criticizing the king, and there's no hint in the Shastra that the king could punish them for that. They weren't breaking any law. So there was freedom of religion. There was freedom of speech. And the king definitely supported Dharma in general, but not in this later sense, which of, of sort of forcing everyone in a kingdom to adopt a, a particular religion. And oh. if you don't do this, if you don't do this, we'll punish you. So that's an interesting point you mentioned there here that that the king was not imposing uh, that, that with religious values. So now we talk about the four regulative principles sometimes as foundational to human behavior, but sometimes they don't include some things which are like vital for social function. Like so you talk about robbing or example. No, for example, robbing or raping or abusing people no but that's no 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 but the the four regular principles are not a complete program for civilized life they're they're for people that want to practice bhakti yoga with an iskon so oh but it's understood like for example in the ashtanga yoga if you look at the yama niyama, the preliminary rules, it does say a stay, uh, you know, not stealing. Okay. So, yes. I mean, it was under, it's just like Lord Chaitanya, uh, you know, a thief joined Lord Chaitanya's mission, but he, he was struggling to give up his thieving, but he was told that if you want to be a devotee, you can't steal. So, absolutely. The four regular principles are, 
They're meant for civilized people that also want to seriously practice bhakti yoga. Mm. So we cannot say the four regulatory principles, as you said, they're not an exhaustive program for uh, social, social administration or ensuring justice in society. No, not at all. The four principles are just, you know, Prabhupada assumed that the people adopting them in other ways would be civilized human beings. Okay. That's fine. So then, um, if, uh, so earlier you said that there will have to be a lot of discussion and analysis before, uh, between devotees as well as between devotees and others before we can actually administer uh, society or whatever part of society we have influence over. So now we could say broadly there are two ways in which society could be st- transformed or we could say a more spiritual or goodness con- co- a mode of goodness could be cultivated. One is top down where as you said Krishna blesses the world with good leaders or the other could be bottom up where well, more and more people or you could just it's all good. I mean just whatever works societies are different it's, it, it doesn't have to be bottom up doesn't have to be top, or usually in most societies a combination so just whatever is practical oh so okay that means in which particular situation whatever uh, whatever level of influence as a devotee community has we can use that to bring about change yeah, we all do the best we can. Yes, my. There's not one little set formula. People, we're in different situations. We know different people. We have different opportunities. So the, everyone just do the best you can in your situation. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. Let me just one or two last questions about this. this is, so if we consider uh, our in today's world, like there is a real threat of uh, religious extremism for India, where I'm in, even for America in future, there are a lot of America haters. So uh, uh, what would be a conception of a strong uh, ruler in today's world? You know, a strong ruler, some you know, different people, depending on their political affiliation, consider, say, <clears throat> in America, some people consider Trump to be a strong leader. Some people in India consider Modi yes. to be a strong leader. Now, we don't want to go into the idiosyncrasies of specific people. But what, how would we define a strong leader in today's world realistically? We can't expect that leaders are going to be like strong devotees or strongly religiously minded people. Well, but, one thing is that since you mentioned the T word, yeah, uh, a strong leader, I mean, I, I don't see the person you mentioned as a strong leader. I see him as a very loud and, you know, Loud leader, but okay, that's destroying, a good it's, yeah, destroying regional alliances. I mean, making America great again. Uh, okay, it's um, a president who, who because of his narcissism and foolishness, starts to undermine and destroy absolutely vital international alliances, I think as someone who's not making the country strong, I think he's weakening the country, putting the country in grave danger. Okay. So, uh, so, so we could say that, uh, say one of the points in today's world is that so much money is being spent on defense, which could be used for so much, so many other purposes. But in one sense, there are real threats also. So a strong defense, uh, uh, I think you may, that is also required, isn't it? For deter, at least for deterrence, if not for aggression. Yeah, of course. Okay. And I think in the last time session, you mentioned that uh, that Yudhishthir, when he was an emperor in the sense that the, uh, that the various kingdoms contributed to a large uh, central army or something like that. Or a central fund. So, and, you know, they paid tribute. And... Uh, if someone was being threatened unconstitutionally against Dharma, then Yudhishthir or whoever was the king, the main king, king of kings, would step in and just um, protect mm. the secondary rulers by enforcing Dharma. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, country is this thing of marching around, attacking, and trying to conquer someone else. It, I don't know. It just seems so childish to me. And childish. It, it's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So we have two more minutes. Three Just more minutes. minutes. So maybe I'll just quickly try to summarize, and then if you want to add a few last words. So yes. broadly, we discussed today the challenge of how to bring about satvic and uh, theistic values without going toward theocracy. And then you mentioned I mentioned that there's a fear of moral policing, but those who call something as moral policing are themselves also doing moral policing. In fact, the left uh, are. quite aggressive in terms of imposing political correctness so we cannot uh, really separate that society has to maintain morality otherwise it cannot have society itself so when we talk about moral values they are they are foundational so moral values means generally that one's freedom doesn't infringe on others uh, uh, others values or others well being so one's own faith is one's choice but how one conducts oneself in society is different and when when a religious government like say taliban is imposing on people's value people's personal choices like that women's dress code and other things so that is a, that is intruding into individual space and that decision has to be made by the individual to some extent and we can't turn really turn back the clock because that itself is an anachronism there was no clock at the time when <laughs> when say islam was founded and uh, when we talk about certain or 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 not to speak of going back thousands of years thousands of years yeah that's true so then uh, so in one sense adhering to dharma it requires deep deliberation and requires leaders blessed by krishna so that they can find out if we are going to have god consciousness what goals are to be pursued and uh, how what are the methods to be used that will have to be carefully deliberated according to time place circumstance and then uh, we talked about I, the, yeah, yes i agree with you yes maraj so i think that the conclusion was that ultimately society has to be changed but whether it be bottom up or top down we start with whatever influence we have and when we take it forward from there mm. says maraj would you like to add any last points why this has been a very thought provoking and very contemporarily important discussion No, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I appreciate your uh, points and your memory. And uh, then I'm glad we we have a chance to talk about these things. Yes, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.